Chris Brown bag. Um, my name is Bart Redford, and on behalf of the Center for Russian and East European and Eurasian Studies, I welcome you. This is our last uh, official brown bag before we have uh, the, the next week's is the uh, presentation of the winner, uh, essay winners. So uh, we'll have somebody in uh, to speak then. I invite you to come back and, and uh, um, see that person uh, speak. Um, we haven't made the announcement yet. We're still waiting for bio information. We've got lots of room in here, so come on in. Um, so look for that announcement. Also look for uh, information on the side table here about some of the different events we've got going on later in the week uh, and next week as well. That includes a uh, international jobs talk, our last for the semester, that's going to take place on Friday, uh, 10 o'clock. It's a collection of people, uh, some of them are current students, but some of them are former, uh, who have had some sort of international internship. And so they're going to uh, tell us about how they found these international internships and what they consisted of and give us some pointers. Uh, and any and all are, are welcome to attend that, whether you're faculty, uh, undergraduate, graduate student. Gloria Funchen, a former uh, student of ours, or recent MA uh, grad, is going to be back and she's going to talk a little bit about her experience in Central Asia and elsewhere. Uh, so I think it should be uh, fairly interesting. Um, and then on Friday evening, uh, we're going to be showing The Cherry Orchard. This is the, the film. Uh, you know, staged play uh, that uh, is going to be shown in Woodruff Auditorium over in the uh, Kansas Union. So um, we're hoping for a big crowd, uh, and uh, uh, we've got Annie Kokobobo, who's from Slavic Languages and Literature, who's going to come in and uh, give a short intro uh, before we, uh, you know, put turn loose for the play. So you're uh, more than welcome to come and see that. That's uh, at 7 p.m. on Friday. Uh, our speaker today, uh, Alexis, is a uh, Reese MA. Um, she is uh, set for graduation this May and is a graduate of Arizona State University with a degree in secondary education, uh, history with a minor uh, in Slavic studies. She's fluent in uh, Serbian and her research focuses on people and nationalities of Eastern Europe and former Yugoslavia. And I've just been told that this uh, uh, presentation is in, in part a product of a readings course that was taken with Professor Law. <clears throat> Hello everyone, um, so my name is Alexis, I'm Marisa May, and today I'm going to give a presentation about this man here, this is Bishop Nikolai Velimirovic uh, from Serbia, um, and it's really about um, his kind of, it takes time period we're going to talk about, it takes place after World War I, kind of beginning World War II, um, and kind of what he, it's his reflection on what he saw happen during World War I, why he thinks it happened, and uh, where he hopes the Serbian people, Europe, and the church, capital C as in all of Christianity in Europe, um, where they can go from here. Um, just a little aside, uh, Nikolai Velimirovic is a very popular in the uh, Serbian identity, culture, nationality. Um, Serbia has a list of like the top 100 Serbs in history, and he's number 89. Um, so he's, he's very important. Um, I think almost every Serbian family has an icon of them in, their, in, his, in our house. Um, and uh, yeah, so he is he's, he's important to the Serbian people. Um, but before we get into that, you kind of have to, a little bit of background on him. So he was born um, in Lelic, Serbia, which is um, right outside of a bigger city of Valjevo, Western Serbia. Um, and he was born on the feast day of um, St. Naum of Okrid, um, which becomes ironic as he later becomes the Bishop of Okrid, so kind of everything comes full circle. Um, he was born into a very pious farming family. Um, his family was poor and is, is typical, it's especially in Serbia, very poor nation, farmers. Um, people didn't have much, so they reverted to religion, and he actually credits his mother as being um, his inspiration for uh, leading a religious life. And um, they went to, uh, he was born very sick. Um, he was just a weak child. They didn't actually think he was going to make it. Um, usually in the Orthodox Church, you baptize a couple of months after birth. They baptized him a couple of days after he was born because they weren't sure he was going to make it. Um, he was baptized in this monastery here, that's Celia, um, which is in Valuable, the bigger city that he. Um, is I guess a, a suburb from, and every this is the church of his family. Every Sunday they would walk to church, and his mother would tell him stories about Christ and the Serbian people and Serbian history, and he just really he got hooked. Um, this is also where he received his um, like what would be equivalent to an elementary school education, and then once he um, got older, he would go into the city into Valjevo for more formal education. 
um, as is typical in, I guess, all nations, you either go, you have to serve a mandatory military sentence, or term, sentence wasn't a good, <laughs> sorry, wasn't a good term as we have military people sitting in this room. Um, but he actually, he wanted to, he thought that he was destined for a great military career, um, he had like a strong faith, but his body was terribly weak, he was um, not overly tall, and the army commanders told him his shoulders were too square, um, so he actually failed his military physical, and um, he was like, well, if I can't be in the army, I'm going to become a priest. Um, so in 1902, he entered a seminary at St. Saba in Belgrade, um, and then um, would go on to continue. He was a very promising student, very smart, had an easy knack for languages. I think when he died, he spoke eight languages. Um, and he received, if you don't need one doctorate, you need two, right? So he received two formal doctorate degrees, one in theology and one in philosophy. The one in doctorate, he actually wrote in German, obviously not his lang native language, and then the, his doctorate in philosophy published in French. Um, it was um, after he returned home from his studies, his PhD studies, he became very ill with dysentery. He thought he was actually going to die, and he, the you know, legend goes that he prayed to God to bless him, um, to save him from what he thought would be his death. Um, and if he did, he would devote his life to God. And that's exactly what happened. He was cured of dysentery, um, and he was tonsured a monk. Uh, December 19th, 1909. Um, I put the date up there. It's kind of a homage. Um, December 19th in the old calendar church is St. Nicholas Day. His name is Nicola. Um, and that's also his family, Slava, his family's Saint Day. So it has a, a very important meaning to him. So he chose that day to, be, um, to become a monk. And then not even a full year later, he was elevated to an Achimandrit. Um, I don't know how to say that in English. I'm sorry. Um, but it is uh, an elevation of more honor and respect within the monastic order, um, not so much in terms of uh, extra responsibilities, but it means that you are respected by your peers and that you put in a lot of service for the church and for the people around you. I guess I don't use this when I have the computer going. Um, so what comes next? So Serbia during World War I, um, just a little aside if you don't know. So Serbia was... Um, devastated during World War I. Um, proportionately, it had the highest death rate of any other nation, but um, you don't really hear about it because Serbia is so small. So you have to think, Serbia is about the size and geogra geography, geographical size of Virginia. Um, so very small, and it could be people blame them for starting the war, so we don't care how many Serbs died, or it's just not relevant, I don't know. Um, but after World War I, the Prime Minister of Bulgaria actually said that Serbia, as we know it, ceased to exist. The Serbia of the past was no longer around because everybody had been killed. And in some ways it was kind of true. Um, Serbia lost 30% of its total population. It came out to about 100, oh, it's right there, uh, 1.1 uh, one and a quarter million people. 60% um, of all men in Serbia died. This includes civilians, military, um, so two-thirds of all men died. Some people will associate this to the reason Serbia will have political problems later. It's because all their men died. I think it's an oversimplification, but believe what you will. Um, but just a breakdown. So the majority of the civilian deaths um, were from um, ethnic violence, from the invading factors, but also a terrible wave of typhus um, came through Serbia and killed them a, a good... Um, a good majority of Serbian civilians. And then the total death toll left about 500,000 um, Serbian children orphaned. They would be taken in by family members. Um, they would be sent abroad. Um, there was nothing, Serbia had no social welfare system. Um, and it was kind of up to the surrounding village, town, family to take care of them. Um, but a significant chunk of the civilians that died, died during Serbia's retreat to Corfu, Greece. Um, the Serbian military um, thought that if they fled Serbia to avoid fighting, that they could also avoid death, um, which in theory sounds like a good idea. But Serbia is, it has itself and is surrounded by nations with horrific mountains, terrible, jagged, cold, um, 
part of Albania and Montenegro, which is Serbia's bordering countries, claim to national pride is that they were never they were never conquered by the Turks because the Turks could never get over the mountains. Well, the Serbs couldn't either, apparently. Um, so on October 7th, 1915, a retreat of Serbian military and civilians um, began, but due to starvation, sickness, um, and in general, um, you know, violence, you have a line of civilians with no way to protect themselves. They're easy to pick off and raid. Um, only about 155,000 actually make it to Greece. And we actually celebrated the anniversary last Tuesday. Um, but of that 155, we don't really know how many actually lived once they got to Greece. Some of them, the sickness postponed itself and waited until they got to Greece. And around 5 to 15, we're not sure, 1,000 more people died once they actually got to Greece. Um, there's a famous Serbian song. It was once can contemplated to be our national anthem. Um, it's the name of the song is Tamo Daleko, um, if anyone's familiar. Um, and it was actually written about um, the retreat to, um, to Corfu. The Serbian people refer to it as Albanska Gogota, um, which is kind of, it alludes to Serbia's national Christianity. Um, Golgotha was the name of the rock from the mountain that Christ was crucified on. So Albanska Gogota is like Serbia's crucifixion. Um, so after World War I, um, Nikolai Velimirovich was actually not in Serbia during World War I. He was sent abroad by his patriarch, Patriarch Gavrilo, um, to kind of advocate in America and England um, why these allied forces would fight for Serbia. It's a tiny nation, tiny people. I don't know if I've ever met a Serb before. Why would we fight for them? So he gave lectures, he gave sermons to kind of boost the Serbian people to the outside community, to let them know what they were fighting for, that it was worth it, and that Serbia appreciated it because they, they could not defend themselves on their own. Um, so Serbia, or Bishop Nikolai Velimirovic, he comes back to Serbia after the fighting has ended and he sees what has happened to his beloved Serbia and he um, says that right now Serbia exists in both light and darkness. Its light has to be its faith, its prayer. The Serbian people, in order to continue, have to continue to build the church, remain loyal to the church, and they have to keep praying. Um, but its darkness is its pain and suffering. Serbia has a, a historical narrative of pain and suffering, which we like to play upon too. Don't get us wrong. Um, but that the Serbian suffering is not new. We. They, Serbia had just come out of 500 years of Ottoman conquest, um, and their road was obviously um, not easy, but he kind of used this as a national boost um, to say, if we, can, if we can make it through 500 years of Turkish aggression, then we can overcome four years of, of war. Um, you know, why would we let it stop us now? Um, and what we, we as in the Serbian people, what the Serbian people need to, co to concentrate on is that there were people that made it out. Serbia as a nation still existed after World War I. The church was still functioning. Um, it was broken, to say the least, but it was still there. It was still standing. And that needs to be something that you focus on is the positive of it and not the negative. Um, and then he also will allude to, you know, Serbs' inherent Christianity, orthodoxy and Serbian identity are almost synonymous with each other. Um, and he kind of applies Serbia's trials and suffering from World War I to the story of the passion. Um, the war itself reflects the, what he, this is all him, um, the unjust trial of Christ, um, the, uh, charges brought against them that were not true in the immediate um, beginning of war after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Um, then the torture of Christ is reflected in how many people, how many Serbian people actually died um, during the war. And then um, the Judas in the story would be the Bulgarians, who um, Bishop Nikolai is not a fan of, um, talks about it openly and um, calls them swine. Um, because the Bulgarians are, they're Slavic people, they are Orthodox, yet during World War I, they were on the side of the Ottoman Empire, and they fought with the Ottoman Empire. Um, and he saw that as the ultimate betrayal of Slavicness, of Balkan Orthodoxy. Um, and a lot of, actually, Bulgaria committed a lot of outside um, 
kind of atrocities against the Serbs during World War I under the hood of, of war. So aside from his advice for Serbia, he also has concerns about what the war meant for Christianity in Europe as a whole. Um, he said that we should not be surprised that the war happened. Um, it's disappointing, yes, but he kind of alludes to the fact that we, as in Christians in Europe, uh, we let it happen. Um, the church is sick and weak. If the church was actually strong and was had any say at all, either politically or re religiously, it would have been able to stop political leaders, um, persuade them, or even... Um, you know, touching a Christian string in the, the soldiers to not do this, um, and that was not the case. He says that part of the reason for this happening is that the Christian church is too compartmentalized, um, and he recognizes this. Obviously, he's a member of the Serbian Orthodox Church, but he sees that the different denominations, while they have their place for geography in a bigger Christian worldview, are concerning. Um, and he said that they're all self-absorbed, including the Orthodox Church. He says that the Orthodox Church, you know, claims to be the right, the true, the oldest, and it isolates, it isolates itself from other people who are not Orthodox. The Catholic Church, um, it has a Pope. Obviously, he's not a fan of the Pope, and the Pope can speak for God, and he doesn't think that, that it doesn't agree with it, thus the Catholic Church isolates himself. The, Ag the Anglican Church criticizes the more Eastern churches as being too extreme, and it isolates itself to just Northwestern, um, Northwestern Europe. And then the Protestant Church, everybody's too extreme, and the Protestant Church is the real church. It's the simple church that Christ really wanted. So no one is really, although they all believe the same thing, they all have the same Christian values, no one's really working with each other, and he thinks that that's a problem. Um, he sees Europe as the beacon of Christianity. When you think of Christianity, you think of the continent of Europe as the majority of Europe is Christian itself. Um, so there should be some common ground, some moral Christian ground that all churches should be able to come together to know that this, what this is in World War I, was not right and um, that we cannot, we can't let this happen again. And he said the biggest evidence of the church's brokenness of its problems happened in that this war was primarily a Christian on Christian war. It was Christians on both sides praying to the same God for the destruction of the other person and thinking that their side was justified and the other side wasn't when they're both kind of kind of believing in the same thing. Um, so in 1919, so this is right after he comes back from his trip to England and America, he becomes, oh, no, thought I need to explain a picture. It's just him. Um, he becomes the Bishop of Zicha, um, which is kind it's a province in southish Serbia. Um, that's just a picture of him, his congregation, his bishop. Um, but almost immediately after he becomes the bishop of Zicha, um, Patriarch Gavrilo um, says, I've changed your appointment and we're now going to move you to Ohrid. Um, Ohrid, um, he saw it as a, a diocese and epiparchy that was in dire need of a strong, firm hand, which he thought Nikolai had. Um, Okrid is, which is, this is the monastery he was at, as you can see, kind of secluded. It's in what would have been the very southern reaches of Yugoslavia. It's in modern-day Macedonia. It's on Lake Okrid. Um, it's, you, it's about seven hours from Serbia proper now. Um, so you can imagine it's roads probably not as great then. You were looking at a very lengthy drive um, or horse ride. Um, and it was very isolated, and the stigma around the diocese in Ohrid was that it was still very Ottoman, um, and that's why Nikolai needed to go there. There was a lot of people, although considered to be Christian, they weren't practicing. Um, Patriarch Gavrilo was also concerned that there was still um, rampant paganism, outright displays of belief in magic, um, and that it wasn't necessarily from their being lack of Christian, but it was a lack of their exposure to Christianity. As being a southern and rural province within the Ottoman Empire, the, the Ottoman Empire was not going to make sure that the citizens of Ohrid were good Christians. They were just going to leave them alone, and that's what happened. Um, so he stayed in Ohrid for several years, and in his letters that he writes to people around him, people that were close to him, um, he is upset that nobody is coming to visit him. 
Um, but like I said, the, the travel is just atrocious. And he even, when he hears that people that he knows are visiting Serbia and they don't come visit him, him in Ovid, he takes it personally. Um, but he also uses this as a time of reflection. The majority of the um, holy works that he writes, the books that he publishes, he writes during his time at Ohid because he has free time. Um, so he does say that while it was um, lonely and kind of annoying, my word, not his, um, that he was able to kind of reach a different level of spirituality within himself because he really was only praying and doing the self-reflection on top of building up um, the Orthodox community there. And then in 1936, he is made the Bishop of Zicha. Um, again, can kind of reassume his throne, and he will actually remain um, the Bishop of Zicha until he dies um, several years later. So um, a lot of what we know of uh, Nikolai Velimirovich um, comes from letters that he wrote to people. He, there is no autobiography that he wrote about himself. Um, nobody wrote the biography at the time about him. Um, and a lot of the letters that we have to reference what was going on with Nikolai come from Bishop George Bell. Uh, George Bell is an Anglican bishop. He is from England, obviously. Um, and they met during um, his kind of, during Nikolai's lecture circuit that he did during World War I. Um, um, and he f immediately had a connection. Um, and in 1915, this, was, this is the first recorded letter that we have between the two. Nikolai writes a letter to George Bell to ask him if he can help to relocate um, Serbian Orthodox seminarians and new priests as he is worried that with the war going on, World War I, um, that they will not be able to continue their studies, that they're, by going to school, their immediate lives are in danger. Um, and George Bell agrees, and he sees a, an importance in that you need to continue the Christian education. Um, the priests and uh, the seminarians went to an, Engl an Anglican university um, and they brought in, I believe, um, a seminary teacher um, from Serbia that wasn't living in Serbia but had moved to England. So they were at an Anglican university but still receiving an Orthodox education. And the two of them thought that this was a great model for how European Christianity could, could work. Um, both of them were kind of in a position of rebuilding their churches um, and their nations after World War I, both England and Serbia in different ways had um, aspects of life that were kind of devastated, but both of them saw promise in rebuilding after World War I as an ultimate, um, if we're Christians and we can survive, then we can also rebuild. Um, and we also get in the letters discussion of what they want in a world council of churches um, kind of like what we'd have an international political organization today where world leaders would come together and talk about political things. They envisioned uh, um, like an international organization of priests where they could all get together, come to common ground on common Christian um, ways to lead a nation, laws, how to work in tandem with your political institution. Um, which they thought was part of the reason that World War I happened, that World War I, um, the leaders were godless atheists who were more likely to listen to academic leaders as opposed to their church leaders, which they think led to a lot of problems. Um, and hopefully, if we can establish a World Council of Churches, we can also prevent anything like World War I happening again. We can use the church, um, the Christian church, to kind of meet individually with political leaders to know where the church stands on things um, and how they can work together to achieve goals to better everybody. Um, and from these letters, um, we get Nikolai going on another kind of educational tour, um, this time primarily to England, um, and he's invited by George Bell. He visits a number of, um, of Anglican churches. He has a long stay, I think a couple of months at Westminster Abbey. Um, where he is just giving sermons and lectures about, he's kind of thanking England for helping Serbia during World War I. Um, so England actually during World War I sent um, several hundred doctors and nurses to Serbia to help with the typhus um, outbreak, and a lot of them died just from direct contact to the sick people. So he kind of thanks them for their help, um, you know, you gotta build up the national 
bond between the two. We couldn't have done it without you. And then also to let England know that Serbia was a country worth fighting for. We're little, but we are mighty. Um, and we um, appreciate it. Uh, when George Bell originally sent the invitation for Nicolae to come, there was problems. Um, Patriarch Gavrilo actually um, objected. He said he wasn't sure if um, it was right for an Orthodox bishop to be in an Anglican church talking about Orthodox things and Serbian things and having nothing to do with the Anglican church. And together, him and the leader of the Anglican church came to a common decision that it was fine as long as Nikolai wasn't delivering any prayer services, performing any sacraments, as he was just there as a visiting lecturer that it was fine for him to continue his lectures. Um, so that kind of brings us up to right before World War II, Serbia, um, Nikolai has kind of taken on, he's still, still a bishop, but he's now kind of turned into um, diplomat bishop where he's talking to political leaders, he's traveling abroad to kind of build a national um, support for Serbia. Um, and what he develops, this is in the 1930s, is something called St. Sava nationalism, which kind of built off of Serbian nationalism in itself. Like I said, the Serbian church um, and Serbian identity are kind of synonymous with each other. Um, it is a belief that a, among Serbian people that a Serb who isn't Orthodox isn't really a Serb at all. Um, so, St. Sava Nationalism, their slogan is Jedan Narod, Jedna Religie u Jednoj Državi, which just means one nation, one people with one religion in one state. Um, and this was, especially for him, this was a no-brainer. Um, it's not really to say it was nationalism, but he just believes that if it's a Serbian nation, that the people of Serbia should be Serbian and that the nation of Serbia should be Orthodox. Um, he gets criticism from the, I guess, outside powers or academics for supporting the Chetnik movement um, during World War II. Now, the Chetnik movement was a, a royalist movement started during World War II, anti-communist, pro-monarchy, um, and they were also very, very orthodox, um, very Serbian. The Chetnik movement gets a revival during the 90s, not the same group. Um, and the concept of a Chetnik Pop or Chetnik priest um, becomes a, a kind of a, a no-brainer, a priest supporting a non-communist, pro-Orthodox Serbian movement. Um, so even today, in modern times, we have priests that openly identify as Chetnik priests. Um, and so this is him, actually, that top picture is... Oh, I did it. Okay, this is Momčilo Đuric. He is a prominent... Um, Chetnik leader during World War II. Um, he actually will eventually be exiled and sent to America, and he's buried in California. Um, and then this bottom picture is him. He had just led a prayer service for Chetniks, blessing them before they go off to war. Um, and this movement started early in the 30s, so actually before the war had started, Chetniks were mobilizing, and the idea was out there. Um, so prior to World War I actually starting, um, Bishop Nikolai, Patriarch Gavrilo, and a couple of other more prominent bishops in Serbia um, hold a meeting with King Paul, who is the king of Yugoslavia, to tell him, do not sign any treaty to align with Hitler. Um, king Paul of Serbia thought that signing a treaty to align with Hitler and the Axis powers would prevent anything that happened during World War I. If we're on their side, they won't kill us, right? That's logic. Um, but the holy men in Serbia think that this is a trap and that Serbia, if we made it out of World War I, we can do World War II. Um, so please, don't sign any agreement with Hitler. And Paul doesn't listen. And 1925, um, he signs the Tripartite Treaty. They align with the Axis powers. And almost immediately, he is protested against, removed from office. He is exiled. And the... Um, slogan of Boya Rat Nego Pact, so better war than any pact, um, is the kind of the slogan of Serbia. They'd rather go to war than sign any treaty to align with Hitler. Um, so two days later, the treaty is nullified. King Paul is exiled. He is expelled from Serbia, and his younger nephew, who is not even technically legally old enough to rule a country, is only 17 at the time. Um, this is King Peter II. Um, he becomes the, the king of 
Yugoslavia of Serbia, um, but he's eventually exiled and driven out too. Um, but within days, a, a week or two, Germany invades Serbia. So they signed the treaty and it was kind of, it had been whispered, this is not confirmed, that um, Hitler had plans to invade Serbia anyways, whether they signed the treaty or not. If they signed the treaty, he thought that his invasion would be much easier. If they thought, then they weren't prepared for it, then we can come in and it'll be fine. Um, so what happens to Nikolai and Petra Gavrilo after Germany invades? Well, almost immediately after Germany invades, the two men are sought out and they're imprisoned. Um, they are going to stay, um, they're held in monasteries, two of them in the same monastery, and then they are transferred about every six months to different monasteries around Serbia. While they're there, they can wear their vestments, their, their robes, um, but they can't hold any services. Um, Orthodox people can't come and visit them. And some of the monasteries that they were in, they were locked inside the monastery when the town outside of them was being burned, actually burned. And this was kind of a, a psychological kind of torture for Nikolai and, and Gavrilo as they couldn't do anything but really pray for their people at this time. There was no tangible help that they could give them. Then September 15, 1944, both Gavrilo and, um, and Bishop Nikolai were transferred to Dachau concentration camp. Um, but their, I guess, experience was not what you would think. You send a priest to a concentration camp. While their experience was not typical, um, a lot of the times priests in concentration camps were treated worse than the actual prisoners to make a kind of an example of them. Um, Patriarch Gavrilo and Bishop Nikolai were considered special prisoners. So they were kept in the separate quarters that had a, a chain link fence. Um, they had windows in their quarters. They could, again, wear their vestments. They didn't have to shave their heads or their beards, um, but they couldn't, they never actually saw the work camp. They never saw the prisoners. Um, they regularly interacted with Nazi officials and the Nazis um, were told by direct orders from Hitler to treat them like you would a, a German officer. Um, so again, kind of a, a psychological torture. They couldn't really do anything and they had to know that while they were there, also in prison, that what they knew what was happening in the work camp. Um, he actually, so they are liberated. They are transferred to Slovenia to a small work camp um, and then again to Austria. And so their time actually in concentration camps, not long, though it did take a very hard toll on their bodies as they were both older at the time, um, that just their imprisonment and their limited mobility kind of had an effect on their health. Nikolai's health was, as we know, was already kind of a sickly man and he didn't think that, um, he limited what he ate purposely while he was in the concentration camps um, to kind of, he thought that he, if he ate well while he was in there, it would be against what he was, he's, he's like a martyr for the Christian people. So if he were to be in a concentration camp eating like a German officer, it would be not right for him. Um, so they are liberated, 1945, war is over. And Nikolai actually, he actually notes that he thinks he was treated worse by his American liberators than by the Germans who imprisoned him. Now, I don't know if that is true. I think, this is just spectation, spec, I don't, what, this is just a guess, that it's probably the Americans treated all of the people they liberated the same. They didn't see Nikolai as a high-ranking member of the Serbian Orthodox Church. There was no hierarchy. He was just another prisoner that they needed to liberate. So there was no care and he was older, and there was no care taken to accommodate him. He was just moved along with everyone else. Um, so immediately following their liberation, both him and Gavrilo moved to England temporarily, and they basically only stay there because that following fall, um, King Peter II, his son, is being baptized at West Westminster Abbey. Like I said, he was exiled, so his family actually grows up in England. Our This is our current crown prince of Serbia now, um, but they are connected to the Holy um, the royalty in England. They are of the same family in some way or another. Um, and after the baptism, Serbia, uh, Nikolai leaves for America. He resettles there and um, Patriarch Gavrilo goes back to Serbia um, only to basically to die. Um, they are in exile. Their citizenship was revoked. All of their possessions that they had 
that they, while they were in Serbia, were taken from them. They are gone. Um, so Nikolai kind of moved to America with nothing. He didn't have anything except the vestments and whatever he had accumulated while he was in England. Um, so the majority of his time was spent at St. Sabre Libertyville, which is in Illinois, it's kind of the suburb of Chicago, about a half hour outside. Um, and that is, that's Libertyville Monastery behind him. Um, and that's where he spends the majority of his time. Um, and then he rotates between St. Vladimir's and St. Tichon's in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, he's a seminary professor, he is a lecturer, he's a priest, um, he's still a monk. Um, so he kind of is just rotated between the different monasteries here in America um, to lead and um, raise future, sem uh, future priests. And as I said before, he remains the Bishop of Zitra until his death, even though he was absent um, from 1941 to 1956 um, as kind of a, a respect to him and what he'd done for the Serbian people. The chair was not refilled while he was imprisoned or in exile. Um, and he will later um, be canonized as. Um, so Sveti Vladika Nikolai Velimirovich of Zitra is his full title in the Orthodox Church. Um, basically just Holy Bishop Nikolai Velimirovich of Zitra. Um, he dies March 18th, 1956 um, at St. Tichon's Monastery. Um, he actually died while in prayer and they found him in a kneeling position at the foot of his bed. Um, he was buried in Libertyville at the monastery there um, because he was still in exile. He was not allowed to come back to Serbia. Um, and then once communism had kind of fallen, Yugoslavia breaks up, they transfer his body back to Serbia and he is reburied um, in Lelic, Serbia. Um, he's canonized in the church March 19th, 2003. They held the service at St. Sava Belgrade. Um, Belgrade Vrachar is the head of the Serbian Orthodox Church. Um, May 23rd, and he is commemorated on two days, um, on to one to commemorate his death and then the other to um, the arrival of his, or the beginning of the transfer of his relics to Serbia. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> Anyone have any question? I'm going back to the <laughs> professor. My understanding of history is after World War One, they created this thing called Yugoslavia. Yeah. Did uh, Bishop Nicholas ever buy into that idea? No. No. He was kind of the idea of a pan-Slavic nation to him um, worked on paper, but um, he was he was Serbian and he had a an idea of Serbian nationalism. So even though they were in Yugoslavia, he considered everything Serbia because within context within his context everything. <coughs> was Serbia. So Yugoslavia to him was, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do Serbian Serbian church have such powerful and influential uh, figures, religious figures nowadays? Um, no, that's actually why, at least in the Serbian church, we don't have a lot of, we did in our, um, like our early years, the very beginning of Serbia, in Christianity, we're talking like 11th and 12th century. Um, a lot of our prominent figures were our church leaders. We didn't have, um, we had kings, but the kings were kind of under the, the control of the bishops and, and the patriarch. Um, but it, he is kind of our, our contemporary Serbian national like intellect. And his education, his l knowledge of languages is just not is not typical of Serbian, you know, Serbian priests and intellects at, at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I assume he knew English. Yeah. Did. And I have one other question. How, I don't know, relevant, cognizant, how young people today in Serbia, is World War I in their mental map? I mean, is that, <laughs> I know here, you know, 2017, because of the anniversary, Americans are kind of uh, rediscovering World War I. Is, it, is there a greater de degree of this historical awareness of World War I? I think so. Um, well, I mean, the cachet of we started World War I yeah, is, still, <laughs> is, still, <laughs> is still there. Um, but the, the day, the June 28th, is a holy day in the Serbian Orthodox Church. It was strategically picked by Gavrilo Princip because it was, it's the day of Vidovdan. It's the commemoration of the Battle of Kosovo. So June 28th, 
for everybody, anywhere, any serve in the world is, is a big day. And it is now synonymous with Didotan in World War I. Um, but also, like I said, um, Albanska Gogota is something that Serbian kids learn of as they're younger. Like my, my grandmother, my mother, like were taught songs and stuff about the, the trials and the strife. Serbs never let anything go. So I think that, <laughs> so I think definitely World War I is still, is still cognizant. Maybe not the, the numbers and they don't get the bigger effect, but like Serbia's trials during World War I, I think people are still very aware of. But you would say young people on the streets of Belgrade are much more likely to talk about the NATO bombings than yeah. you know, like well, point, point to the buildings that have holes in them. Right, there. and that yeah. they were alive during right. that. So yeah. anything they know yeah. of World War I would come from a family member or you know uh, something they were taught in school. Yeah, the, the, the war in the 90s is much, <laughs> much more poignant for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, can you tell us a little bit more about the state of the Serbian Orthodox Church today? Today. Mm -hmm. So the church today, um, I think if, if it were Nikolai seeing what the church was today, I think he'd be disappointed in the Serbian Orthodox Church in Serbia today. Um, he thinks that a big problem with the church after World War I was that the church was being highly influenced by political leaders, where he thought it should be the other way around, where the church leaders influenced the politicians. And today, um, I think that that's exactly why I think we have political leaders who are just controlled in the church. We have, we have priests and bishops in Serbia who are um, bishops in rural communities, but they drive BMWs. <laughs> um, and um, it's just, there is definitely a, a breakdown. And I think that a, a big problem with Christianity in Serbia today has a lot to do with the fact that it was communist for 60-ish years, um, and that any um, orthodoxy that happened under communism was kind of done in secret. Um, though I will say, I think Serbs are bad communists because <laughs> their communism is not the same as everybody else's. And I do know personally a lot of communist families that baptize their children. So how communist are you if you are still believing in uh, kind of orthodox doctrine? But I do think that there, there is a lot of political influence now in the church that Nikolai would have a problem with. You mentioned mm -hmm. the St. Sava National. Mm -hmm. When the Yugoslavia started to fall apart in the late yeah. 80s, early 90s, did people like Milosevic you know, appeal to that? No. Um, so the leaders of the 90s, they're all Serbian, so by, I, by association they are also Orthodox, mm -hmm. but their Orthodoxy was public displays of Orthodoxy used for, I think, more political scenes. Um, and that any, I think their notion of St. Sava or nationalism and that any nationalism, especially in Serbia, needed church at the center of it was not the case. Um, they used religion, obviously, as a segregating factor, but the church itself and actually being Christians, practicing Christians, I don't think was there. Well, one thing that you, know, you and I talked a lot about during this was the interesting combination of uh, Nikolai's strong Serbian nationalism with a very, I mean, surprisingly kind of ecumenical view of Christianity in Europe. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could talk about what Serbia is like and orthodoxy in general is like on the ecumenical scene in Europe and just to kind of compare to him. I think that um, from a Serbian perspective that any churchly council it has is only among other Orthodox denominations. Um, I mean, basically every nation that is Orthodox has its own national church, Bulgarian, Russian, Ukrainian, um, Serbian, Macedonian, and they all have their different uh, church leaders and they all function separately, um, but they are all Orthodox and I think in terms of orthodoxy today, Serbia today, I think that would be the only kind of church communication that they would have. I think that they more um, 
exacerbate their differences. I'm not Anglican, I'm not Protestant, I'm especially not Catholic, um, so there's no reason to discuss this union outside of my Orthodox brothers, mm -hmm. which is a very common saying, Orthodox brothers, um, especially in Serbia. It seems to me, if I remember correctly, that World Council of Churches mm -hmm. was infested with agents of the communists from the USSR during that time, and mm -hmm. it kind of became a unofficial spokes platform for the Soviet Union. They thought they could you know, weaken the capitalist structure via this World Council of Churches. I think it, it's actually interesting, the World Council of Churches. Nikolai was for it. He was a proponent of the idea, but the meetings that they did have, he was not invited to. And, but um, George Bell was, and Nikolai knew they were happening. Some of them happened in Eastern Europe, and he was very upset that he was never invited. He was like, this is kind of my idea. Nobody invited me. <laughs> um, but I think his, um, if what you're saying is true, it definitely makes sense. Um, and I think also his overt, um, while he did believe in an ecumenical you know, Christian council, he was a Serbian nationalist, and I think his national identity so strongly tied to Serbia was probably the reason that invitation got lost in the mail, but he was upset nonetheless. Mm -hmm. well, if there are no further questions, I want to thank you all for coming.